Welcome to another uh, vaccine update. Uh, we will begin with uh, some facts about the vaccine and then answer some frequently asked questions. So I'll begin with a look at the technology. Um, what, what you see there is a representation of the coronavirus. You can see it's a sphere with spikes on it, uh, gets its name uh, from the look. It looks like the corona uh, during a solar eclipse. So you can see it's a sphere. Those spikes are very important and we'll talk about that a little bit because that's how the virus attaches to the human cell and that's how it gets into the human cell and then causes the infection that we know as COVID-19 and causes a lot of damage and destruction. Um, what you're seeing inside that sphere is a uh, spiral coil, which is the genetic material of this virus. And within that, there's a small portion that is colored red. And we'll talk about that because that small portion is what is used in this technology for this vaccine to create that uh, good immune protection. So let's begin by looking at a comparison uh, chart. Uh, here you can see uh, the middle two uh, rows are showing the Moderna and the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccines. Both are what are called RNA vaccine technology. They both require two doses. Um, the Moderna requires a dose on day one and again day 29, so four, four weeks apart. The Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, um, one, day one and day 22, so that's three weeks apart. Both of them require cold storage, but the Pfizer-BioNTech requires the ultra cold storage at minus 70 degrees Celsius, um, that's Arctic temperatures while the Moderna requires regular freezer temperatures of minus 20 degrees Celsius. The other two vaccines you see, the one on top is the Oxford University AstraZeneca vaccine. That's a UK-Swiss collaboration. And then the Russian vaccine, the Sputnik V, the Gamaleya. Both of them are different. They're not RNA. They're very uh, traditional vaccines using a viral vector. So they have a non-active virus that carries the genetic material for their vaccine. They also require two doses. Um, their storage requirements, however, are very simple. They just need refrigerator, uh, regular fridge temperature, um, temperature storage. So let's look at the actual vaccine itself. So if you'll follow this diagram from the left, you can see the little spiral, a short snippet that's called the messenger RNA. It's called messenger or mRNA because it carries a message a code for a specific protein, and that's the spike protein. Um, so when you look at that picture there, the syringe contains just the messenger RNA and a fat droplet around it to protect it because the messenger RNA is very fragile. So all of the vaccine components can be broken down into two simple parts. The main part is the messenger RNA, and it is inside a fat droplet. So very simple components, uh, no cells, no preservatives, none of that. And once injected, you can see in the human form uh, on the left-hand side uh, into the muscle of the arm. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see that messenger RNA is, goes into the cell and the cell then translates that code uh, into a protein, the spike protein. It's golden in color. And then you can see that spike protein is recognized by our immune system naturally. Uh, it identifies that as a foreign particle and creates specific antibodies, those red Y-shaped antibodies you see in the picture there. And those then, uh, once uh, this person is immunized in this fashion, they're protected against the virus. So in real life, once you get this vaccine and then exposed to the virus, the virus cannot attach to the cells because those antibodies are made to attack those spike uh, parts of the virus. And so this spike cannot attach and therefore the virus is neutralized. It's unable to infect, unable to cause disease. And so that person who gets the vaccine is protected. And we'll see that this is a highly effective, 95% effective vaccine in protecting the person from getting the disease. So let's look at the um, trials. The first one is for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. It's called Comirnaty or Tozinamiran. Uh, that's the uh, pharmaceutical uh, name for the vaccine. So a lot of people have questions about um, these trials, how quickly these vaccines came to be. And usually they say it's 10 years. Why is it so fast? 
The main reason is there was adequate funding uh, from Operation Warp Speed uh, that really helped. When you put uh, lots of money behind it, it's a, they're able to do all these trials in a faster manner. Um, but there were, at no time was this whole process uh, shortened. So the way they got this is these vaccines had to go through rigorous trials. The first is preclinical trials. Those are done on animal models and they were shown to be safe. Then you go to phase one human trials where you look for safety again and it was clearly successfully safe. Then you go to phase two human trials, uh, human beings, and those phase two trials look for safety, efficiency, and then deciding on the dosage of the vaccine. And finally, you go to phase three. Now, these are the real trials because in the sense they are large. You're talking about, uh, in this case, 44,000 participants, and they look for safety again, they look for efficiency again, and they make sure that the dosage is correct. Now, that's where we are. We have, this had to go through all those trials and they successfully passed all of them, including the phase three trials. And we'll look at a detail just to understand what they found and why this has been approved by the FDA. So the trial participants, um, 44,000 of them, there was a good number of representation. You can see half of them were male, half female. About 82% of them were white people. 10% African-American people, 4.4% Asian people, and less than 3% from other racial groups. Uh, you can clearly see 26% uh, were Hispanic or Latino, Latina, and 21% of participants were greater than 65 years of age. So there was one in five were of that uh, group above the age of 65. The median age was 51. By that, they mean half of the group of 44,000 were less than 51 years of age and half were greater than 51 years of age. Again, a very good representative population of this trial so that the results can be generalized to the uh, world and the wider population. So let's look at adverse reactions, um, something everyone's concerned about. Uh, what kind of adverse reactions did the trial participants experience with the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine? So the most common were injection site reactions. 84% of folks that uh, had any reaction reported some pain, some local swelling, uh, nothing more than that discomfort, but um, distressing nonetheless. And then the others, fatigue 63%, headache 55%, um, muscle pain 38%, chill 31%, joint pain 23%, and fever 14 All of these uh, are expected uh, in any time you give a vaccine that provokes an immune response from the natural immune system of the human body. These are exactly the symptoms we expect. So these are what are called reactogenic or expected symptoms. So none of these are unexpected, number one. Number two, all of these are self-limiting and self-resolving. In other words, they go away without medical intervention. So usually the first day is the worst, the second day is less, and vast majority are done by day two. Some of them, they have lingering symptoms for about a week, but by the end of the week, they're all gone. And, and these are what we expect. It is a, a indication that the vaccine is working. Now what we are concerned about would be the severe adverse reactions and only 0.5% of the trial participants experience any such and we'll look at them in detail. So what were the most common severe adverse events noted? So in those that got the vaccine, um, they noticed 0.04%, so very small, one hundredth of a percent of folks got appendicitis. 0.02% uh, had a heart attack, 0.02% had a stroke. Now in those that did not receive the vaccine, and these are folks that received a salt water injection or saline injection, um, those folks had a um, small percentage had pneumonia, a very small percentage had atrial fibrillation, and a small percentage had syncope. Um, so atrial fibrillation is a heart rhythm problem. It's a very um, a small number. And then syncope is a passing out or fainting spell. So you can see the 12 folks that got appendicitis, eight of them were in the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine group. And then four of them actually uh, just received the saline injection. Uh, they got the saline shot in the arm. Of that eight who had appendicitis in the vaccine group, six were in the younger age group, as you would expect, between ages 16 and 55. And then two were in the older age group of greater than 55 years of age. 
Um, one of the cases had a perforation, one of the cases had an abscess. These are complications of appendicitis. All these cases of appendicitis, the atrial fibrillation, the pneumonia, the heart attack, the stroke, these are all what you would expect in the general population. These are what are called background rates of occurrence. These diseases occur anyway in the general population. These are not related to the vaccine. And these are what they would expect to see in these folks that had underlying conditions. And none of these severe adverse events were related to the vaccine itself. Looking at deaths, there were six deaths in all. Two occurred in the vaccine group, four occurred in the placebo group, the group that received the saline injection. So in the vaccine group, one of the deaths was someone who had obesity and atherosclerosis, which is a disease of the blood vessels. So they had underlying conditions. That person died three days after dose one. The other participant had a cardiac arrest 60 days after dose two and died three days later. Again, all of the deaths, there were or underlying conditions that led to the death, death not uh, due to the vaccine. And of the four deaths that occurred in the um, arm that received just the saline injection, so these folks did not receive the vaccine, there were four deaths. Uh, two were unknown causes. One was a stroke and one was a heart attack. And then three of those deaths occurred in an older age group greater than 55 years of age. Now, all of these deaths, all of these side uh, adverse events were all analyzed by experts in the field of uh, vaccination and by experts in that field of immunology and physicians and others. And these were independent safety review board. All of them concluded that these were what you would expect in the general public uh, at the general, uh, at the same rates. Uh, these are not related directly to the vaccine. Again, so in conclusion, the side effects were those that you would expect from a vaccine. The adverse events and deaths are not related to the vaccine. So this vaccine already, even in this large phase three trial of 44,000 people, was shown to be extremely safe. So they looked at folks that had other underlying conditions. So in uh, this 44,000 trial participants, some of them had a pulmonary disease, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, cardiovascular disease, some uh, had cancer as well. All of these folks did very well. In fact, there was a protection anywhere from 95 to 100%. So what I mean by that is if there were 100 people who got the vaccine, 95 people never got any disease. Uh, the five people who had the vaccine and got the disease, they had a very mild case of COVID-19. They did not have any permanent lasting effects. In fact, their symptoms were very mild, uh, almost non-existent, and they recovered very well. So the researchers concluded this vaccine is 100% effective in preventing severe disease. It's 95% in, in preventing any type, mild, moderate, or severe. And the only time it failed, the 5% of the time, those folks were still protected because they just got a very mild form of the disease and had no lasting effects of COVID-19. Again, excellent results. Quick way to understand that result is this graph. Um, so the blue line is those people who got the vaccine. The red line represents those that did not get the vaccine that just got the salt water injection or saline injection in the arm. So you can see in the x-axis, which is the horizontal line there, there are days numbered 0, 7, 14, 21, 28, 35. So seven day intervals, they're following these uh, trial participants. Initially, both the red and blue lines are parallel because after getting the vaccine on day one, uh, they did not have protection. So both groups, the red uh, no vaccine group and the vaccine group had uh, same rates of COVID-19 disease occurrence. But once you get past day 10 and then they get the second do dose on day 21, it's a totally different story. You see the blue line, there are no further occurrence or incidence of disease COVID-19. But the red line, those that did not get the vaccine, those that just got the saline injection, those folks continue to have occurrence and incidence of COVID-19 disease, clearly showing the vaccine protected uh, the people who got it and the salt water injection did not protect them and they were uh, vulnerable to the COVID-19 disease. So in summary, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine is extremely effective in preventing disease, 95% effective. And what's more impressive is 
those greater than 55 years of age, they also had significant protection at 93.7%. So in all, the 5% of folks who ended up getting the disease despite getting the vaccine, they were also protected because they only got a very mild form of the disease with very few symptoms and with no long lasting effects and recovered fully. So this is a very, very effective vaccine, very impressive. To give you an idea of all the independent experts worldwide who uh, studied this data independently, reviewed it thoroughly, asked questions of the researchers, and they came to the conclusion that this is uh, a perfect uh, vaccine to stop this disease. And so they uh, authorized this in all these countries. You can see Canada, United States, pretty much most of North America and then South America, the big countries there, Chile, Argentina, and you can see a few other countries up there, Panama, Ecuador, Costa Rica. And then Western Europe, all of Western Europe, all 27 Western European uh, Union nations all signed on to that. Uh, Great Britain, of course, uh, and then Switzerland, and then uh, pretty much most of the Middle Eastern countries. In Asia, you can see Singapore. And uh, so it's a very effective vaccine, uh, not only with its results, but also the fact that this was vetted by uh, global experts uh, in vaccines. So let's look at the second vaccine that we are giving here that has been approved by the uh, FDA for emergency use. And this is the Moderna mRNA-1273. Again, just like the Pfizer vaccine, uh, the Moderna vaccine also had to undergo preclinical trials, phase one, phase two, phase three human trials. And these are all very rigorous trials and they successfully passed all of those. And the phase three trial here had 30,000 participants, uh, half of whom received a saline injection and half of whom received the mRNA vaccine. They gave a 100 microgram uh, injection in the arm day one and day 29. And both these trials are being followed for at least a total period of two years. So these are what are called ongoing trials. The trials have not ended. Um, what the FDA looked at was two months of data. So they submitted, the FDA required at least two months of uh, data. And the reason they chose two months is because in all the previous vaccine trials we've done, most of the adverse events, most of the, anything that we need to be concerned about present within the first two months. The more rare forms of adverse events uh, occur over that two year period, which is why this is still an ongoing trial but two months are plenty uh, evidence to um, immunize across the world because we need to stop this disease, which is causing so much death and so much morbidity, causing so much long-term effects on pretty much every organ you can imagine. This disease affects your lung, the heart, the brain, the liver, the kidney, the blood vessels where it causes blood clots uh, to occur pretty much anywhere and everywhere. Uh, and it's very devastating, it's long-term effects. So looking at the trial participants in the Moderna group, you can see again, half were male, half female. 36% of participants were communities of color, 10% were African-American people, 5% Asian people, less than 3% other racial groups. 20% or one in five are Hispanic or Latino, Latina. And then you can see 25% or one in four individuals were greater than 65 years of age. Again, a great group of people to test this vaccine to make sure it's safe, make sure it's effective and it provides protection. Looking at adverse reactions. So the most common was again, injection site pain, 91.6% reported that. The others that people commonly reported were fatigue, 68%, headache, 63%, muscle pain, 60%, joint pain, 44%, chills, 43%. So again, all of these are expected. These are the symptoms you would expect when you give a vaccine that generates an immune response. What I also want to state is, uh, you know, the United States right now, we are close to 7 million vaccines given uh, for these two. And so far, the reports have been extremely favorable as far as safety and side effect profile. And remember that these side effects you would expect to see, and only a small minority of folks really present with these symptoms, uh, and that's who uh, we are looking at. But the one that we always are concerned about are the severe adverse reactions. This is, again, a very small minority, 0.2%. So what are the common severe adverse events? Let's look at that. Again, in the vaccine group, 
there were five cases of heart attack, and then those that received the saline injection, there were three cases of heart attack. And then cholecystitis, which is uh, gallbladder inflammation, three cases were reported in the vaccine group, zero in the placebo group. Uh, in the nephrolithiasis or kidney stones, three, were, uh, three cases were observed in the vaccine group and zero cases in those that received just the saline injection. So looking at those that received the saline injection, there were two reported severe adverse events. One person had pneumonia, accounting for 0.05% of that group, and then pulmonary embolism, which is a blood clot in the lung that was seen in the group that received the saline injection. So that placebo group, there was a case, so that accounted for 0.03%. Again, if you look at these, these are very small numbers, and these are kind of what you would see as a background rate. So these are in the general population in these age groups at the rates they occurred in this group. That's what you would see because in the background rate, most people are susceptible to get these kind of um, uh, diseases um, because of their underlying illnesses. Looking at deaths, there were a total of 13 deaths reported. Six occurred in the vaccine group and the seven occurred in the placebo group. That is the group that received the saline injection. Two deaths in the vaccine group were greater than 75 years of age and both had pre-existing cardiac disease. One died of a cardiopulmonary arrest 21 days after dose one, and one died of a heart attack 45 days after dose two. The 70-year-old with cardiac disease were found dead 57 days after dose two, and a 56-year-old with high blood pressure, chronic back pain on opioid medications um, died uh, uh, 37 days after dose one, and the cause of death was head trauma. So opioid medications are um, drugs that are narcotic. And the 72-year-old vaccine recipient with Crohn's disease, known Crohn's disease, underlying short bowel syndrome, uh, was unfortunately hospitalized for platelet, low platelets, uh, kidney failure, uh, obstructing kidney stone, and then 40 days after dose two, uh, died from complications. And one vaccine recipient died of suicide 21 days after dose one. And then if you look at the placebo group, the group that received the saline injection, uh, three people died from heart attack, one died from abdominal perforation, uh, one died from uh, like a sepsis syndrome uh, from a known cancer, one died from COVID-19 disease, and then one was an unknown cause of death. Again, all of these deaths, that's, they are occurring the same background rate. In other words, in the general population, the, these age groups with these underlying conditions, that's, those are the rates of deaths you would expect. So none of these, uh, after thorough review by independent safety board, did, were connected in any way to the vaccine. In fact, the vaccine was not the cause of these deaths. These deaths were what you would expect in the general population. Another um, way of looking at this vaccine is similar to the one we saw with the Pfizer-BioNTech. These are called incidence curves, and you look, the red line is those that got the vaccine. The blue line is those that had the saline injection. And clearly after day 10 and past day 28, 29, which is when they got the second dose, there were no further incidences of this disease. So if you look at the blue line, those are the folks that received the saline injection. Those folks um, were not protected, and you can see after day 10, they continue to have incidents or occurrence of the disease. But the red line is those that did get the vaccine, they were protected after day 10, they were uh, no longer um, had any further instances of the COVID-19 disease. Again, clearly showing that this vaccine is very effective in those with chronic lung disease, heart disease, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, liver disease, HIV, all those folks benefited from it as well with uh, rates of protection of 90 to 100%. So 90% of the time, 90 to 95% of the time, these folks were also well protected. So in final analysis, this is again a very effective vaccine, 94.5% protection. And in the 5% of cases that did get the disease despite getting the vaccine, the disease was very mild and quickly resolved with no long lasting effects with very or no symptoms. And then again, if you look at the impressive fact here, those 65 and older were 100% protected. In other words, the, that age group, which is most vulnerable to this disease. In fact, the uh, current uh, statistics clearly show 85% of deaths from COVID-19 occur in those ages 65 and older. 
So you can see this vaccine is very protective of that vulnerable group. A quick mention of these DART trials. These are called developmental and reproductive toxicity trials. And these are looking at the effects of the vaccine on those that are pregnant and then the developing embryo and the fetus. And then after pregnancy, after delivery, the effects on the child. These, these tests cannot be done on uh, humans because of the fact that these are um, ethical considerations. You don't want to do this to uh, pregnant women. So the only way these DART trials can be done is in female rats, uh, animal models. And they concluded after giving this 100 microgram dose, the same dose that were given to humans, that there was no effect on reproduction, no effect on the developing embryo, no effect on the developing fetus. And then after delivery, they followed and no effect on the development of the uh, animal past uh, delivery. So these are kind of uh, good findings to support the current recommendations for pregnant women and those that are breastfeeding to also get the vaccine once they uh, have a conversation with their physician about the risks and benefits. Now, um, looking at this world map again gives you an idea of all the countries that have currently approved the Moderna vaccine, the Canada and USA, and then of course the uh, 27 nations of the European Union and also the United Kingdom, which just came out uh, with their approvals. So again, um, broad approval for this Moderna vaccine by global experts. Uh, again, a reassuring sign that these studies were vetted thoroughly by experts in the field. So let's look at some frequently asked questions. So vaccine is okay to take uh, for those that are pregnant or those that are breastfeeding. Uh, important thing here is to have a shared decision making with their physician or pharmacist partner and make sure that they understand. Um, but if it, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology recommends that pregnant and lactating women should be offered this vaccine. The reason is the risks of getting this COVID-19 disease are bad for pregnant women. Uh, the uh, devastation, the long-term and short-term impact on pregnancy and on the woman's health uh, is uh, very bad, and which is why uh, the recommendation is made to offer this uh, vaccine. And the question asked is, if you have had the infection in the past, is it okay to get the vaccine? The answer is yes, because um, uh, there is a chance for reinfection. It's a low chance, but still exists. Um, natural immunity uh, doesn't always generate enough and correct amount and type of antibodies. But the vaccine is scientifically engineered to produce specific neutralizing antibodies that attack the spike protein and neutralize the virus, which is why we say even if you got this infection in the past, uh, recommendation is for you to still get the vaccine. Uh, you can wait up to 90 days uh, if you've had a past infection or get it right away. Either way, um, that's, that's the recommendation. And then messenger RNA vaccines, that is both the COVID uh, vaccines that we are currently giving, both Moderna and the Pfizer-BioNTech, they don't affect your DNA. In fact, these vaccines, uh, once injected, the RNA is kept out of the nucleus. The nucleus is where our DNA exists, and DNA is our genetic material. It is well protected by the cell. The RNA never has a chance to get into the nucleus. It only stays within the cell, does not enter the nucleus, and never has any interaction with the DNA. So your DNA is safe, your genetic material is safe. What the RNA vaccines um, do is this messenger RNA is translated into protein and then it's degraded. And very quickly, within a few days, the RNA de is degrades. It's a very fragile thing, which is why they have to store it at the cold temperatures. So once it's translated, it's degraded and no longer exists in the body. So this vaccine in a way disappears. And, and the second booster dose is given therefore to make sure that the immune system uh, develops robust response. Um, so, in the final analysis, is your DNA is safe, the RNA disintegrates after it does its work. So there's no trace of this vaccine left after it's given. And then if you are taking any vaccine, say you're getting the flu vaccine or the shingles vaccine or any other vaccine, uh, you want to wait 14 days um, between that vaccine and this vaccine. And if you had the disease and were given um, plasma treatment or uh, antibody treatments where they give you as infusion of antibodies, uh, those treatments you'll have to wait 90 days before you get this vaccine. And 
both the mRNA vaccines, both the Pfizer-BioNTech and the uh, Moderna vaccine do not contain aborted fetal cells. This is another question that comes often, and it's a very important question because ethical reasons, um, people have sensitivity to this, and uh, it's very important to be uh, fair that this vaccine was done in a very ethical manner. No fetal cell lines were used during development or production. And then, therefore, when you get this vaccine, you can be sure uh, not only were no fetal cell lines used, there are no fetal cells in the vaccine either. The other question that comes up quite common is Bell's palsy. It's a very temporary condition. There is no linkage between vaccine and Bell's palsy. There were five cases of Bell's palsy that occurred in the population that were in the trial, but those cases were not linked to the vaccine. Those are what you would expect to occur in the background. That's normally what you would expect. And then allergies, um, people specifically allergic to polyethylene glycol, uh, should not get the vaccine. And uh, this is a component of the laxative that we give when we uh, do colonoscopy. We prepare the bowel, we give the person undergoing colonoscopy a day or two before to take that laxative and that contains polyethylene glycol. So unless you had a reaction to that, a severe allergic reaction to that, you're okay to get this vaccine. And then no testing is needed before you get this vaccine. People always ask, should I test? Should I know if I have antibodies? It doesn't matter you should get this vaccine. The recommendation is get this vaccine. So don't do any tests before you get this vaccine. And then a little commentary on allergies. There are all kinds of allergies. The one that we were most concerned about is severe allergic reactions. So the technical term for this is anaphylaxis. It's very rare, one in a million uh, vaccines, only one person in a million uh, people receiving vaccine developed this. And so it's extremely rare. Um, so we, we observe folks that come to get the vaccine for at least 15 minutes, and usually these uh, reactions develop very early in the first uh, five to 10 minutes. If you had mild reactions, let's say to foods, to pets, to uh, anything, latex or oral medications or any kind of reaction, none of these, even se severe ones to any of these, um, are not a reason not to get this vaccine. In fact, this vaccine, like I said, the components in this vaccine are just two things, a fat droplet and the messenger RNA no other preservatives, so you don't have to worry about any of these things. And give you an idea, here's a comparison. Each of the columns is a vaccine. If you start at the left, the Shingrix, the shingles vaccine, followed by the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, followed by the flu cell vaccine, which is a flu vaccine. And the last column is the saline injection. If you look at, across that, local pain, redness, swelling, muscle aches, fatigue, headache, chills, fever, gastrointestinal symptoms like vomiting, diarrhea, all of these are common to these immune-provoking vaccines. And they're very favorable if you look at the Pfizer-BioNTech one. And if you look at the saline injection, even there you see these. So the bottom line is, these are indication that the vaccine is working, number one. Number two, these resolve pretty quickly. I know they're distressing for the person undergoing these symptoms, but remember the benefits of not uh, being fully protected against COVID-19 is far more important than unfortunate effects of these, which will usually go away in a day or two. Uh, but remember, these vaccines protect us from long-term effects and more importantly, from death. So to understand better what I meant by background rates of illnesses and what we call incidental illnesses, you saw in the vaccine trial groups, people had heart attacks, strokes. So what you have to understand, on an average day in the United States, we are 320 million people in the US. On any given day, you can expect about 110 people to develop some forms of disease, including Bell's palsy, which is a very temporary paralysis of the face that goes away. And then same way, Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is given a lot of press uh, with that and vaccines. Remember, 270 or so people every day in the US develop some form of this paralysis, which is again a temporary paralysis that resolves over time. Again, these are not related to the vaccine. So quite often when these happen, you know, just after or a few days after someone gets a vaccine, people draw the wrong conclusions. Remember that every single day, unfortunately, people do die unexpectedly. Some of them have strokes, some of them have heart attacks, some have seizures, some have Bell's palsy, some have Guillain-Barre syndrome. None of these are linked to the vaccine itself. So we'll kind of dwell on this one because people are worried about mutant 
variants of this uh, virus. So the original virus, the original ancestral strain, uh, starts as it uh, starts infecting the world uh, population of the world, it undergoes some changes because as it multiplies, it makes mistakes. Um, this virus has 30,000 base pairs. So it makes mistakes anywhere from 10 to 20 of those base pairs. So it's only 20 out of 30,000. So imagine it's a very minor change, one tenth of a percent change. And those changes are always concerning because we are worried that that will give it some form of protection against uh, vaccines or medications. The good news is all the vaccines, including the Pfizer, BioNTech, the Moderna, the Oxford, AstraZeneca, and one that's currently in trial, Johnson Johnson, all of these, they protect by training our immune system to attack this spike protein in multiple sites. And that's what the picture on the right is. The picture on the right is showing all the mutant changes that underwent when interspecies transmission occurred. You can see in the bottom right there, the silhouettes of the human to dog transmission. So there was canine transmission. Then you see below that feline transmission to cats, big and small, lions and domestic cats. Then below that mustelids like minks and ferrets uh, transmission occurred. And then finally rodents like mouse and hamster. Now all of these interspecies transmission occurred from humans and then back to humans and some of them caused some minor changes. The good news is these vaccines, the way they're designed, they attack all these changes. You can see the red, blue and magenta sites of changes. All the sites are attacked by this uh, vaccine. It creates this immune response. Uh, so the virus does not escape the vaccine. And additionally, there's another response called a T cell response that the vaccines create that protects us. So these vaccines are highly effective despite these um, minor variants that we are beginning to see in the coronavirus. So thus far today, about 7 million of the population of the United States have been vaccinated. And you can see the states there, South Dakota is a leader in terms of almost 5% of our population has already been vaccinated. So a few other states that have reached that kind of levels are North Dakota, you can see Nebraska, West Virginia. So this is a very good thing. We are giving vaccines very quickly and we continue to do so week after week. This is a very large and logistically complex undertaking because these vaccines vaccines have to be stored at specific temperatures, as you all know, and once you thaw them, you have to give them away and you have to coordinate that efficiently or you'll be wasting this precious commodity and uh, losing vaccine. So kudos and hats off to all the folks at Monument Health that have done an uh, amazing job uh, getting these vaccines out. So to give you an idea, if you compare all 50 states, um, rank them, uh, South Dakota is third. We have given up to 4.2% of our uh, people have received a vaccine. And then you can see 36,890 shots have been given. The 54% of the dosages that were given to us have already been given away. And we continue to give them daily, um, anywhere from 300 to 500 people receiving vaccines. Okay, at this point, I'm gonna pause and hand over the microphone to Scott Peterson. So I'm Scott Peterson and I'm here to talk about our plan for vaccinations, what we've been up to over the course of the last four weeks, uh, where we're at today, and then what the plan is for the future. And um, as previously stated, the, uh, the South Dakota Department of Health um, has recruited a number of organizations in the state, the three main health systems, to coordinate vaccination activities throughout phases one and two. Um, the state is ultimately in control of that vaccine and they are guiding this process. Um, they're guiding the allocation of the, of the vaccine and then really the, the priority of the people that are getting the vaccine. Here at Monument Health, we are the steward of vaccine in Western South Dakota. Uh, the state is basing uh, their recommendations, they're basing their criteria on criteria that comes from ACIP, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, which is a, a part of the CDC or the Centers for Disease Control. So there's been recommendations that have been published and you'll find some variations and how states are um, applying these recommendations. So if you do have friends and family in other states, which, are, which I'm sure that you do, um, you may, uh, may see some small differences between those other states, and that is because they are different. There are some differences between how states are, uh, are uh, allocating out these vaccines to people. 
the following uh, four slides, including this one, um, are from the Department of Health website in South Dakota. And it's a very, very nice infographic on the different uh, phases that we are going through right now of vaccine distribution. So the first phase is phase 1A, and that's frontline healthcare workers and long-term care facility healthcare workers. For the most part, this was completed a few weeks ago, and uh, we did a great job of getting this vaccine out to these groups. Many of these people are already receiving their, their second, second vaccination at 21 days because this was all Pfizer vaccine with the first shipment that we received. So phase 1B is long-term care residents. These are people that reside inside of a nursing home or an assisted living facility. Um, these vaccinations began last Monday, a week ago, and will continue on for a couple of more weeks. Um, many people in our community that live in nursing homes and assisted living facilities have been vaccinated. These vaccinations are being coordinated by CVS and Walgreens. They received national contracts to, uh, to provide vac vaccinations to this group of people. Phase 1C is the phase that we are currently in and working on at, uh, at Monument Health. And so this includes other healthcare workers that weren't part of Phase 1A, also public health workers, emergency medical services, law enforcement, and correctional officers. And so we continue to work through this group, both on the internal side to Monument Health as well as the external side of Monument Health. Uh, we are working those things in parallel. The group after 1C is 1D. This is a very large group inside of the state of South Dakota. This is persons with two or more underlying medical conditions, teachers, persons aged 65 and older, people in congregate living settings, independent living uh, facilities, and funeral service workers. The state estimates that there are about 250,000 people in this particular classification. And that is inside of the state of South Dakota. So when, when this phase does begin, it is going to take a while to get through, through that group. Phase 1E is fire service personnel and then other critical infrastructure workers. This is waste, and, waste uh, water and water, energy, finance, and a number of other uh, areas that are mentioned on this slide. This group is also very large and includes about 250,000 people. So this phase will also take a while to complete inside of the state. After that phase one is complete, we anticipate that there will be many more doses available. We'll enter into phase two. Uh, supply will be uh, likely to meet demand at this time. And we will also continue on with phase one activities while we're expanding into this. And so as far as timeline goes, we don't anticipate being in phase two until spring, of, uh, spring or summer of this year. And again, during all these phases, the state will allocate vaccine to Monument Health based on the current phase that we're in, population, and some other factors. So um, current vaccine um, administration in the state. So the first dose that we've that we've administered. Um, so the, the first doses we've received is a, is a little short of 7,000. And then about 910 doses have been sent outside of Monument Health to facilities that are non-Monument Health. So these would be facilities in Phillip, um, in uh, Hot Springs, and in Martin, for example. And so um, we're working through phase 1C and uh, getting close, uh, closer to the end of that, and then we'll move on to fun, uh, phase 1D in the future. So in summary, this process is going to take several months. And so um, be aware of this. Everyone is going to have an opportunity to be vaccinated in this, in this process. There's a lot of variables that are at play, including the supply of the vaccine and then the uptake of the vaccine. The state is going to continue to guide this process along the way. Again, Monument Health is the steward of the vaccine in Western South Dakota, and we're distributing it and giving it to, to patients according to state guidelines. 
Please be patient as we walk through these steps to complete all of these priorities. Um, and with that, I will finish up for today. So thank you very much for your time.